Hi guys, Oliver here from Spitfire Audio. I hope you are doing well. In this video, I'll be showing you how to write for and incorporate woodwinds. We'll be looking at each individual instrument, how to write for them idiomatically and how to use those wonderful colors of the woodwind section. I'll be showing you briefly what's in the pro version uh, compared to the core version of the symphonic woodwinds. If you want a detailed overview and if you already know how to write for woodwinds but you just want to check out what's in the new version, please check out Paul's walkthrough. He'll be going through it in detail. So I've written a piece or I'm in the process of writing a piece and I've done the woodwind arrangement to show you those examples and give you some ideas of how you could write for woodwinds. Let me just play this for you. Before we begin, let me briefly show you the differences between core and pro. First up, and very important, all the instruments and articulations are exactly the same in the core and the pro version. What you get in the pro version is extra mic positions and mixes. So in the core version, we get close, tree and ambient mics. And in the pro version, we get an additional Outrigger. The outrigger is a sideways extension of the Decca tree. So just as a recap, the close mic is the mic closest to the section. So here the oboes, or if you have a close mic of the violins, it's close to the violins, so it gives you a more dry sound. The Decca tree is uh, the mic that sits above the conductor, so it's three mics. The ambient uh, is to, are the room mics and the outriggers, again, are the sideways extension of the decatry for an extra wide stereo field. So very useful if you score for movies or TV where the dialogue sits in the middle and you just want to get out of the way of, uh, of that dialogue. Um, I would say it's a um, hyper real sound. It increases the width for kind of dynamic and dramatic effects. Then you get a close ribbon mic, typically a more rounded, warmer sound, a bit vintagey. Uh, then you have a stereo stage mic, which sits with the orchestra, very beautiful mix. The gallery, it's the galleries up in Air Studio. So Air Studios is a beautiful old church and it has galleries and uh, we put mics up there and it's a very 3D, more distant sound. Then Jake Jackson, our in-house engineer, has created some mixes. So a fine mix for a more pop sound, medium mix for your indie kind of movie and the broad mix for the blockbuster epic sound. So for the demonstration purposes here, I've chosen kind of my favorite setup here. The outriggers all the way up, wide sound, ambient kind of mid. I don't want too much reverb. The tree is kind of my favorite mic. It's the typical orchestral sound and a bit of close variation there. For lower sounds, I put more close uh, or if they have a solo passage. This piece, as you could tell, um, it has some exaggerated things, uh, some runs there that are just for demonstration purposes. My um, inspiration was Ennio Morricone's Hateful Eight. And so these runs are sometimes a little bit exaggerated, but I just, you know, just had a bit of fun and I want to show this to you. 
So let's dive into the woodwind section, beginning with the highest instrument, the piccolo flute. The low register of the piccolo flute is dark and not used that often. The mid register is great, you have good control and clarity. The upper register is crisp and piercing. You have to use that with care. It sounds an octave higher than written, very important when you write for a real orchestra. As you could tell already, it's the most penetrating instrument of the orchestra. It's very commonly used uh, to double the flute an octave higher. So I just want to show you this quickly. In this passage here, the piccolo or let's say the flutes on its own. It's just missing that, that presence, especially in a busy section that I have here. It's just so lovely that you can hear this. And if the piccolo is its, on its own, it's missing a little bit of body. And again together. It's just this very, very beautiful sound. Uh, I've used it here on runs. Or on this one here. Again, very exaggerated run there for that passage. It's very slow and calming. But uh, I just wanted to show you and give you some ideas of how you can use woodwinds. Again, runs can be written slightly differently or you have different options. You can use the notes of the scale. So for this one, I'm in F sharp minor. I've written it up there. And I just go up the scale in F sharp minor. You can also, what I've done here, for example, Go up four, down one, go up four, down one. And it gives that kind of approaching sound. This might even be a little bit quick for them to play. Another option is, is a chromatic uh, scale as well. Uh, if, it, if it's fast, you, you can't really hear the kind of wrong notes in the scale and it just has this kind of sweeping effect. So the piccolo requires very little breath. It's usually the second or third flute that doubles on the piccolo. So if you write for a real orchestra and you have, let's say, two flutes playing and the second flute is playing the piccolo, you have to allow time to switch the instrument. Uh, very important with samples, of course not. The flute's upper register can be very shrill, however the middle is nice, sweet and pure. The low is rich, haunting and breathy, but slightly more quiet. So how to use flutes in your writing? So the flute is a very agile instrument. This is agile than others in the section. And they're very good for scales, arpeggios, and they're very fast for upward sweeps and runs. However, they require a lot of air. So if you want to make it sound realistic, you have to give breaks for the player to breathe. Also, if you write for real players, you've got to do your research. How good is your player, etc. Because, for example, trills aren't easily possible in all positions. Let's have a quick listen how I've used the flute here or the flute section. So some runs again. Then some melodies. Then some rhythmic movements, arpeggiated type of thing. I like it specifically the flutes in the shape of water. If you check out that soundtrack, Alexandre Desplat uses the flutes in a very beautiful way there. Next up is the alto flute. I haven't used alto flutes in my composition. However, it's such a beautiful instrument. It's kind of haunting and breathy. I think it's more suited for solo passages. As you can see in the picture, there's a curved head joint and a straight head joint. So a curved head joint, basically you can reach the keys easier if you have short arms or smaller fingers. The tuning might be slightly harder, but it's, it's more of a personal preference of the player. So the alto flute sounds a fourth lower than written, so take that into consideration when writing for it. We've also included a bass flute and I think the bass flute has a little bit of a similar role. I mean, it just sounds so beautiful. It's more... 
it, I see it more as a as a solo instrument or if you want some special effects. For example, this one, the overblown. It's very cool. And if not, I think again, solo passages when, when the rest of the orchestra or the accompaniment is more quiet. I'm controlling here the vibrato as well to give more life into the samples, which is uh, very important. Next up is the oboe, a very important component of the orchestra. It's a very lyrical instrument. It's very good for solo passages, for dramatic kind of scores. Uh, the best register is the mid register between B3 and A4, so around here. In the lower register, it gets a little bit nasal. And then in the very high register, it doesn't really sound like an oboe anymore and you lose a little bit the quality of the instrument. The oboe is very good for staccatos. Um, it's not good to start from nothing because the mouthpiece is quite small, so you require a certain amount to get the tone out of the instrument, so you can't really start from nothing. Uh, that is more suitable for the flute or for the clarinet, uh, for example. Let me play you an example here. So I've used it as, a, as an accompaniment here, a kind of a rhythmic motif. And if I play you all the rest of the woodwinds here... It's the only instrument that plays that kind of movement, but in that register the oboe has a really clear tone and you can recognize and hear uh, what the oboe is playing. Your ear is kind of drawn to it. And then I said a solo passage right in the end here. And again, here in the end, you can hear the vibrato is slowly uh, fading. So the player uh, plays more espressivo and then towards the end, I'm programming the vibrato to, to non-vibrato, basically. So next up, we have the cor anglais or English horn. This basically replaces the first octave of the oboe and has a beautiful tone in that very first octave. So B2 to G3. Check out uh, Rodrigo's uh, guitar concerto, uh, which is absolutely amazing, and it features a cor anglais as the lead instrument. Next up, the clarinet, the most versatile instrument in the woodwind section. The clarinet is effective in its almost full register. It has a very wide dynamic in almost the whole range. It's good for arpeggios, runs, blending with other instruments or solos. The staccatos might be slightly better with the oboe, but many times staccatos are used in combination with slurred legato passages. They're good, as said, starting from niente, from nothing, so very good for quiet passages as well blending in with other instruments and they have really amazing glissandi upwards. One important thing to know, this might not be applicable if you recording or playing with a high-end professional player, but the clarinet has a very important kind of division between its range, so it has a breaking point, so you have this kind of really haunting beautiful sound down here. And then up here, from uh, B flat 3 to B3, here you can hear it, it's a slight change of tone, it's not as mellow anymore.
And when I go down there, it's it's more rounded. So this it's called the break there. So if you haven't got a player that is uh, very professional, you have to be careful not to go across this kind of break too often and too fast. It can be hard to control the tone there. So again, here the clarinet. I'm using it for runs as well because it's it's very good at that too. Again, very fast run. It might be too fast for a real player. But you, you get the idea of the run and the sound of the clarinet being able to do runs. Uh, then some melody lines. Very, very beautiful and rich sound. Next up, the bass clarinet. So the bass clarinet sounds a ninth lower than written. It has similar characteristics to the clarinet with similar dynamic possibilities and ranges. Often it's used in the lowest registers and it's very, very effective in its quiet dynamics. So let me play you a little bit here. And then obviously you have in the higher dynamic ranges. Almost slightly distorted. It's, it's a very great and versatile instrument. I also use it, as said, in, in staccato. I find it's very, very strong for staccato passages. Next up, the bassoon. Just like the oboe, this is a double reed instrument. It's the base of the woodwind family and very effective and rich in the low register. However, it's a little less agile down there, right in the low register. Staccatos are perhaps more common, and again, especially for comedy. It's also often used to double the basses and celli to add color and richness. Even though it's considered weak in the high registers, I think it sounds very beautiful and lyrical. I actually think this is probably the strongest part of this library, is the bassoon solo up here. It's just so melancholic and beautiful. I'm using it in that kind of manner in my composition here as well. And then there it changes over. Basically, I'm giving a little rest to breathe. Perhaps could do a little bit more. And then it goes into the bass region, doubling up my basses down here in the strings and uh, the contrabassoon. So I actually want to just talk about the contrabassoon a little bit. So it's an extension of the bassoon and sounds an octave lower than written. It's commonly used to double up the basses because they go insanely low and have a growly, almost distorted kind of sound. So let me just show you this one. And that's the lowest note of the basses, but... <laughs> Absolutely incredible. So it can actually go a whole tone lower than the basses, and that can be very, very useful. So breath-wise, this instrument is quite demanding to play, so um, it's more suitable if you write slower and simpler parts, especially down there. So important things to consider when writing for the woodwind section. I personally think that woodwinds can bring incredible color and life into your composition. And it might be easier, especially if you're kind of approaching this the first time, if you have your harmony sorted out beforehand. So if you've written your string and horn part, and then you start kind of filling in like color book, you, you color in your sketches that you've made with the woodwinds. Unless, of course, you have a very strong idea about the woodwind and, and the woodwinds are actually carrying the main part such as, uh, you know, the shape of water that I've mentioned. So 
some ideas, again, uh, how you can use woodwinds. So there's runs and trills are very, very common. Uh, so I'm using a few runs here. Again, a bit exaggerated there. But for example, here, I think they're quite nice. <laughs> It just kind of accelerates a little bit the emotion and the speed of the or the feeling of the speed uh, of the piece. And then uh, some trills are very nice and held notes just to, to give a little bit of color in there. For example, here, let me just play the woodwind section. So it's just one of the flutes playing a trill. But it, it adds a little bit of movement. Right in my beginning phrase here, I have a trill there. Then uh, doubling up instruments can also be very effective. So for example, here in the end, my flute here and the strings, the violins. You can also do it uh, in lower passages, for example here the bassoon and the viola. So only a little part there, but still that's the idea to give the viola a little bit more impact and, and just a little bit of a different timbre. Then you can do counter melodies. I haven't really done counter melodies as such here. I mean a little bit if you listen here to the flute when the flute comes in. So it's kind of repeating what, this, what the string's doing just a bar later. Another uh, option is to do harmonic arpeggiation and repetitive rhythms outlining the chords. So that's why I'm doing a lot. It's almost a little bit the concept of my arrangements here. So here, for example, with, with the low woodwinds. So I'm doubling actually up the first violins here. Then here again. Again, using those low woodwinds uh, in a very idiomatic way, just with staccatos. I'm, I'm doing uh, octaves here, or fifths. I'm doing octaves uh, before, and here I'm doing fifths. Bass clarinet and a contrabassoon, they're a great combination. To get a contrabassoon can sit an octave below. And in general, for low woods, you want to give wide intervals, and for high woods, you want to arrange close intervals. Another option of using woodwinds are solo passages, as said before. Here the bassoon is great in the high register, the oboe. Uh, the flute is also really amazing uh, to do uh, solo passages. It always depends on your accompaniment but I think the woodwinds are really really a great addition and they can carry a whole theme or a whole film you know like an oboe can be your lead instrument for your main character and because the, the woodwinds have so many colors Let's look at some arrangement options when writing in harmony with the woodwinds. So you have the superposition, which is nicely in order, interlocking, enclosure or overlap, which is sharing the same notes. This actually happens naturally here and there. I guess just be careful and conscious which notes you're doubling up as they will sound uh, stronger. So you want to have the, the right notes selected to do that. Uh, in my case here, I'm using the superposition, which is the natural position. So the piccolo on top, then the flutes, then the oboe, then the clarinet, everything nicely in order. And I've created here this intro to demonstrate this to you. So in my arrangement, it's very clear. I have the bass clarinet. Let me uh, turn off this alternative line that I had. Bass clarinet down here.
adding the normal clarinet, B flat clarinet. Then the oboe. Then the flute legato, ending with a trill. And an octave above that flute, uh, we have the piccolo. And then, of course, you can try out other constellations, uh, such as interlocking, enclosure, or overlap, as I was explaining. Again, here for my chords here. I have it nicely organized. To my ear, this, this usually sounds the nicest. I feel the flute has to sit there. It has, for me, the purest uh, tone. And uh, that's why that's my preferred um, arrangement style. So to sum up, for a realistic sound, you have to write idiomatic for these instruments. You have to write where they're good at. You have to write in the correct range, uh, where they're strong at. You give the player time to breathe, give the player time to swap the instruments. And if you use samples, make sure you do a good mix, good programming, which I know we haven't looked at, but I don't want to expand this tutorial too much. And I thought it'd be interesting to give a little bit of a different approach for once, looking at these each individual instrument instruments. So I hope this was useful. If you have any questions, please let us know in the comments section. We're happy to help. Make sure to click the link below in the description to check out my final mix. And I hope I see you on the next one. Take care. Bye bye.